So, what's your band? What's we are your... Blue Heron. Blue Heron. Out of St. Albans. This is Ethan Sawyer, and I'm Martin Frederick. I just want to welcome everyone to the third annual Substance Use Addiction Summit. We're so blessed for the volume of partners that we have that have showed up today to table and hold booths to teach people about the different treatment and recovery resources in the state of Vermont, and also some in Maine, New Hampshire, and New York. We're super excited this morning for a beautiful presentation from a great lineup of people that are providing services. We're going to be looking at some of the gaps in services and talk about like strength-based ways to bring solution. We're also going to be celebrating recovery today. And we're also going to be taking moments to fill out the memorial wall. This is an opportunity for people who have lost loved ones to addiction to be able to honor their loved ones and have them be recognized. And this is the reason that we do this event. We are motivated to continue sharing information about addiction, to destroy stigma, to break down barriers, and more than anything, to bring people to a place where they can learn that people can recover, that there's healing, that there's growth, and that there's nothing stronger than a person in recovery who is motivated to help others to make this world a better place. So we thank you so much for joining us. We're blessed, we're excited, we're grateful, and we're looking forward to continue working with everyone in celebrating recovery. Hi, so my name's Josh Florucci. I work at Safe Recovery with the Howard Center, and this is our mobile treatment van. Uh, we've got this primarily to treat rural areas of Vermont that clients can't uh, get to a provider or make it into one of our community partners, and uh, we bring the treatment to them. Uh, we have access to case management, safe use supplies, Narcan, Sharps containers, um, we are also doing wound care for clients that are suffering uh, from xylazine wounds or wounds from using other substances. And uh, we'll also have low barrier Suboxone on the van eventually. Hi, I'm Brad Perlin, co-chair of the Substance Use Addiction Summit. This is our third year and we are so excited. Uh, we've had a lot of sponsors, including Savita Health, WCAX, and the Champlain Valley Exposition. We have uh, some high goals for this uh, summit. Uh, we wanna have uh, people recognize those with addiction as, as human beings and, and separate it from the drugs. It's very important. Uh, we're looking for higher reimbursements for recovery uh, so that um, there can be more longer stays available, beds. And uh, we uh, are just so excited about this summit because uh, it brings people together, and there's uh, about 100 booths of residents and recovery, and uh, people can find out um, almost anything that they need to start on a pathway for uh, better health and a, a, a better way of life. Good morning. Good morning and welcome. Good morning, Brad. <laughs> We are so excited to welcome you to the third annual Substance Use Addiction Summit. And uh, uh, I want to introduce myself. I'm Brad Furlan. I'm co-chair with Melinda White, who. <laughs> we had um, a master of ceremonies who had a family emergency. <laughs> so. We are on Plan B in the Master of Ceremonies Department, and you're looking at Plan B here, so <laughs> uh, we'll do the best we can on that. I want to um, first start by thanking our sponsors. Um, we have been in the 
earlier years, really um, struggling to put everything together financially. And this year, um, incredible generosity happened. And start with our platinum um, sponsor, Civita Health, uh, just amazing, uh, made a lot of what you're seeing today happen. Heather Wenzel is here. You'll hear from her a, a little bit later. She's vice president at Civita. The Champlain Valley Expo, our host, um, has been an amazing partner, giving us this facility to work with um, in such a, um, a great way in order to bring the public into our venue. WCAX partnered with us this year, and um, you may have seen the publicity, but it's been uh, really amazing, and uh, we're grateful for that. Vermont Health Department, the Department for Substance Use, uh, Northwestern Medical Center, uh, WCAX, as I mentioned, Sauna at Stowe, Vermont Department of Health, um, United Way of Northwest Vermont Prevention Network, GW Tetro, uh, associated with Chenna's Promise, Granite Recovery, UVM Scholarship, Dirt Tech, Valley Vista, Champlain Toxicology, Peak Outcome Partners, Serenity House Recovery House, Turning Point of Franklin County, Recovery Vermont, VTSU Graduate Program and Counseling, Vermont Alliance for Recovery Residences, Howard Center, Working Fields, Dominion Diagnostics, and Vermont Addiction for Professional Associations. Thank you all sponsors, and if we give them a nice round of applause. <laughs> Our program, summit program, will be a number of speakers, um, which I will uh, lead off, and then um, Melinda and I will share um, talking about who these people are and, and what their affiliation is, and we're grateful to all our speakers. Um, so I just want to say again, I'm very grateful to be here, and thanking all of you um, for everything you do to save and improve lives each day. Uh, this is an amazing group of people, and uh, many of you are boots on the ground. You really understand the real world and what's going on. Um, and thanks so much to our recovery partners, as I mentioned, Civita, CAX, and Champlain Valley Expo, and then all of the others are listed in, on boards and throughout the facility, so um, we really appreciate that. And I want to say a very special thanks to, again, um, Melinda White, this summit could not possibly happen without her. So a great um, appreciation. So we're here today to share hope. For many years, I did my best to drink myself to death. Uh, depression, sadness were real. Suicide was a tool I carried in my back pocket. Remarkably, and I say with incredible gratitude, almost 21 years ago, in a line in the sand moment, I gave up my drinking hat. And uh, I had a chance to um, find life, life to be sober, sober, life to grow, life to work on amazing gifts. Um, I have two children that I just value so much. One, my daughter, 14 years old, we have a sheep farm in St. Albans, and nobody thought I'd have a sheep farm when I was drinking. <laughs> uh, so today's summit is about bringing hope to those struggling with addiction. Many here have found a way to climb out of a deep hole and will share how they did that. The booths, the speakers, it's remarkable. The summit today is about life. It's about finding the gift of each person's soul. And I want to thank uh, Dr. Levine and Jeffrey Trites from the Vermont Department of Health for being here today. You'll hear more from them shortly. Um, they're making a lot of progress in fighting addiction, um, but we're going to hear statistics from the health department. And you know we're, we're still losing lives, so we've got a lot of work to do. Um, we have a memorial wall over here, which um, really emphasizes the fact that, you know, that we are losing people. And please feel free to remember somebody on the memorial wall. 
One of our summit goals has been to call for an increase in beds in Vermont. We have amazing partners here in Vermont, um, but we want to try to see how we can get more financial resource to enhance services and length of stay. And more funding would mean more intake workers and faster and more accessible pathways to beginning roads for recovery. It's in that critical moment when someone says, I've had enough, we want to make sure that they can find the help they need. We're strong advocates for increasing Medicaid reimbursement to support uh, treatment. Um, longer stays, uh, more accessibility, uh, so that it's not in and out and back home and back using, it's in and on something that's a much longer uh, journey to health and to, you know, getting back to where we want people to be. Um, we also want to point out that um, the separation of addiction from the person, and we learned this uh, from, from Greg and Don Tatro. They, they have been um, champions of talking about you have to separate the addiction from the person. Um, and that is something we advocate for um, strongly. Uh, we advocate for tri-state um, cooperation with other states. It doesn't mean not using Vermont resources. It just means why not? If there's more resource, let's not have borders on that. And let's make sure that Medicaid can uh, cross borders with people who need help. Uh, we. Um, the, the summit is about bringing our loved ones back to a dance with life, a dance that trades the in, in, inevitable pain to death to a journey with hope, with connection, and with love. I like to think of each person with substance use addiction as a flower, you know, a flower that can bloom, a flower that needs sun and soil and water. We have all of this here. We have all of these resources that can do this. And uh, Melinda and I want to thank all of you for being here. Everyone here is making a difference. We're not alone. That's the message. Together we can. So we thank you so much. So I want to welcome um, our first speaker from the Vermont Health Department, Jeffrey Trites. Jeffrey is a public health analyst at the Vermont Department of Health. He has worked for the Vermont Department of Health for the past seven years after graduating from University of Vermont with a master's degree in biostatistics in 2017. He currently lives in Jericho with his wife, two cats, and a dog. And come on up. <laughs> All right. Hi, everyone. Thanks for being here. Uh, Brad Melinda, thanks for having me. Uh, as Brad said, my name is Jeff Trites. I'm a public health analyst at the Vermont Department of Health. And I'm here to talk a bit about uh, overdose surveillance in Vermont. Um, I will try my best not to go over, um, but we'll see. <laughs> um, so I presented last year, and I had the same slide, but I think it bears repeating. Um, this presentation is going to include numbers and statistics, and um, but those numbers and statistics reflect real people who lived rich lives, um, you know, people in recovery. Uh, so I, I just want us to keep that in mind as we go through um, this this presentation. So I'm going to start out by talking about some national fatal drug overdose trends. Um, I am going to skip this slide, but um, what this looks like at the national level is we actually saw a decrease in drug overdose deaths uh, nationwide. Um, so we, that ranges from about a decrease of 28% uh, to an increase of about 35% on a state-by-state -state basis. Um, <clears throat> but for Vermont, we had a 5.3% decrease. So to put that in context nationally, um, the U.S. had a 4.5% decrease, so we're about in line with the national average. Um, also, interestingly, I want to point out um, 
many of the increases statewide have been in western states, um, whereas we've seen decreases in the Midwest and eastern states. So what does this look like in Vermont? And I will just say I'm going to be speaking uh, specifically about opioid overdose deaths here. Um, there is a slide later on about uh, those non-opioid overdose deaths, though. So this graph includes the number and rate of overdo opioid overdose deaths in Vermont. Um, so in 2023, we actually had our first decrease in a few years since the 2018 to 2019 year. Um, so this is great news. Uh, I will just point out we are still at 234 overdose deaths. So um, there's a lot of work to, to be done. So this is kind of similar to the previous slide. Um, just more recent data through March of 2024, and, and we do lag our data a little bit to give time for toxicology testing, so that's why it's a little bit farther behind. But um, through March of 2024, we've seen 41 opioid overdose deaths in Vermont, um, compared to 54, which is the previous three-year average. So what does that look like in terms of substance involvement? Fentanyl continues to be the main driver of opioid overdose deaths in Vermont. Uh, however, cocaine involvement has increased over the years. Um, we saw a significant increase between 2022 and 2023, and uh, through March of 2024, about three quarters of opioid overdose deaths involved cocaine. <clears throat> um, so we have also seen some increases in gabapentin involvement, but decreases in xylazine and alcohol involvement. And to clarify, um, alcohol is still a substance of concern. Uh, it's just xylazine was kind of pointed out as one of those new emerging substances of concern in previous years. Um, <clears throat> So uh, additionally, polysubstance use is common, so like the involvement of multiple drugs in overdose deaths. 91% um, of opioid overdose deaths in 2023 involved more than one substance. Um, it is a little difficult for us um, to determine whether multiple substances were taken intentionally or unintentionally, so that is kind of a drawback of, of our data in general, but just something to keep in mind. Um, I also wanted to highlight some lesser known substances. So we hear about different drugs, new emerging drugs from a few different sources, uh, namely the Center for Forensic Science Research and Education, as well as the DEA. Um, and so we'll get these reports of new emerging, emerging substances and we'll look into them, um, or we'll notice new drugs in our, in our data. So this nidazines group uh, we noticed in 2022 and we've been monitoring ever since, but we luckily haven't really seen any in our in our data lately. Um, so in addition, additionally, um, tyoneptine was a new one this year. Uh, that came out in one of the DEA reports, I believe, but um, we have not seen this in any opioid overdose deaths in Vermont to this point. Um, and then these last two, the 2F and the metatomidine, um, these are monitored by the lab that does our toxicology testing, but more at a national level. So these aren't reflected in our data, but we aren't seeing it really much at a national level. So to go over some demographic data, um, and I'll just start out with some data notes. Uh, the map on the left reflects data through 2023, the entirety of 2023, whereas the map on the right is just through March of 2024. Um, you'll also notice the rates in the map on the left are much higher than that on the right. Um, as we move through the year, the rates will unfortunately increase uh, for every county um, on the map on the right, and we'll see some of those statistical differences emerge as well. <clears throat> um, so historically, we've seen high rates in those southern Vermont counties, so Bennington, Rutland, Wyndham, Windsor. Um, additionally, some rural counties like Essex. Um, so I do want to urge a little bit of caution with Essex. Uh, Essex has the lowest population of any county, so any number of overdose deaths will result in a high rate. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> kind of the flip side of that, uh, Chittenden County has the highest number of opioid overdose deaths pretty consistently. <clears throat> Uh, this is another population-based thing. Chittenden County has the highest population in Vermont, so we would expect to see the highest number of overdoses. But in terms of rate, it's sort of the middle of the state. Also, males tend to have a higher rate than females. 
Um, people who are white and non-Hispanic tend to have a higher rate than people who are BIPOC, and the 40 to 49 age group is uh, high as well. However, historically, the 30 to 39 age group has been high. So looking at some non-fatal overdose data, we're actually seeing that same kind of decrease over time. Um, each month for the non-fatal data has been low as well, and these are emergency department data. data. And so now I'm gonna talk a little bit about like programmatic stuff and some new data products. Um, so the health department was awarded the Overdose Data to Action Grant in um, September of 2023. This is a continuation of just the Overdose Data to Action Grant from the CDC. Um, and this funds a lot of our overdose work, uh, namely the social autopsy report, which is uh, where we look at people who have died of an overdose and what their interactions were with state services. Um, the most recent report was published in August of 2023. However, um, we are planning to publish a combined 2022-2023 report next summer. And the point of this is to just give us more time to, um, to kind of standardize things behind the scenes and really make the process easier, which is great. Um, also, through, uh, through the social autopsy, we noticed that construction workers had a much higher rate of overdose death than um, than other industries. And so this has resulted in a very fruitful partnership with uh, the Association of General Contractors in Vermont. Um, additionally, one thing I'm really excited about is the biosurveillance. Um, so with non-fatal overdose data, we it really doesn't tell us what substances are involved very accurately. It's based on what the person who went to the emergency department thought they took, which may or may not be true. Um, so biosurveillance allows us to test, uh, to perform toxicology testing on these people um, to determine specific drugs that were involved in overdose. So it'll give us a more accurate picture of what's going on more quickly. Um, also, there's the surveillance infrastructure piece. OD2A funds, like I said, most of the overdose work at the health department. Um, so specifically, like some of our data work, uh, toxicology testing, so at the office of the chief medical examiner. Um, so it's really core to the work that we do. Um, and through OD2A, VDH, VDH has invested uh, more than $1.1 million um, into supporting local community action to prepare for, respond to, and prevent overdose. And so a couple more slides just on upcoming new data products, that sort of thing. Um, so we recently published the substance use dashboard. It includes a number of measures related to overdose, um, substance use prevalence, prescriptions, uh, as well as treatment. And there's a link and a QR code if you want to check it out. Um, also, we have plans to create a monthly overdose dashboard, which will kind of replace our monthly report, but will include the same information. And again, like the social autopsy thing, that will allow us to, uh, to do more uh, interesting data analyses, kind of save time. And then we have this, this last new data brief here. Um, about 90% of overdose deaths in Vermont involve an opioid, so this data brief focuses on that other 10%, um, and it looks at data from 2013 to 2022, uh, and in that data brief we found that uh, cocaine and prescription medications such as benzodiazepines and antidepressants were most common. Alcohol is common as well, you'll see in this map here, um, that the counties on, in the western part of the state, uh, cocaine has been most common in those counties, and the counties in the eastern part of the state, um, prescription medications have been most common. Although in the northeast part of the state, you'll see those kind of striped counties. Th those are really like counties where two substances were equally common, um, and alcohol is part of those counties as well. Um, and the last thing I want to mention here is about three quarters of non-opioid overdose deaths um, only involved one substance. So it's very different from the population of people who died from an opioid overdose who, you know, there are multiple substances involved. And then just last thing, um, you can find our data and reports on our data and reports page. Um, so that's the Division of Substance Use Programs. There's, again, a QR code and link here. Um, I 
did send my presentation to Brad and Melinda, so feel free to request it from them if you want to check it out or click any of the links or anything you want. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jeffrey. Uh, we appreciate that. I um, want to recognize a couple uh, more people. Uh, Monica Hutt is representing the governor's office today. If you want to stand quickly, uh, thank you for being here, Monica. Mm -hmm. And we have invited legislators here today, and I know that um, Representative Wood and Representative Taylor are here, at least if you want to stand, and any other legislator who's here. You're going you're gonna to get our Legislative Hero Awards, you two. <laughs> Thank you for being here. Um, so our next speaker has uh, been a friend of this summit uh, from the very beginning, uh, Dr. Mark Levine. He's the Commissioner of Vermont Department of Health, and uh, he has uh, been the commissioner since March 6 in 2017 when he was appointed by Governor Phil Scott. Uh, he takes great pride in continuing to lead and support the efforts of all his department's divisions, most notably that of the Division of Substance Use Programs, in their ongoing work to provide creative, innovative, state-of-the-art evidence-based programming in response to Vermont's ongoing problems with substance misuse. And you probably have seen him during the whole COVID. He was a leader in um, helping us all along um, during those periods of time. He's got a great heart, and we welcome again to the summit, Dr. Levine. Hi, everybody. Um, they tell me there's this cybersecurity thing going on, and all of my comments are in cyberspace. <laughs> I am serious, so we're winging it here today. But uh, that's OK. You want five minutes? Is that what you said? All right, that's going to be even harder. Um, so first of all, I mean, I just love being here. The energy, the enthusiasm, the sense of optimism and hope that we just heard about, um, the fact that there's such commitment in this room and such a commitment to collaboration, and that everybody knows this is tough and this is not easy, and if we don't work together, uh, we fall apart. Um, there are multiple ways to skin every cat, and uh, in this setting, there are so many ways to get a pathway to a solid recovery. Um, so, you know, we have a comprehensive system uh, and an approach to addressing and preventing substance use disorders in Vermont. And we work closely with so many partners that I can see throughout the room, but also with state agencies, with federal partners uh, across the spectrum of the, what they call behavioral health. Um, and substance use issues. And the whole goal is implement evidence-based, community-driven, promising practices to reduce harm and increase protective factors for our fellow Vermonters. You heard Monica was announced earlier. Um, I here am also part of state government. Uh, and in that sense, I would like to at least tell you that uh, Though the governor could not be here, he shares in the thoughts that uh, we've been talking about here. He's been a very strong advocate for funding what we call the continuum, meaning prevention, intervention, treatment, recovery, harm reduction, the entire spectrum um, for the entire continuum of substance use services. And um, if you've heard any of his state of the state or budget addresses, you know he really does speak from the heart in trying to work with our very most vulnerable youngest Vermonters uh, in our communities um, and working all the way towards our veterans uh, who have their own issues and everybody in between uh, through harm reduction practices, clinical services, provision, et cetera. 
And uh, we are very laser focused on so many aspects of this. Now, um, I looked at your coals for the summit. I want to comment on a few of them. There's seven of them. I'll comment on maybe five of them. Um, first few talk about increasing residential and recovery beds, extending duration of stay in residential uh, settings, and increasing Medicaid reimbursement to support those beds, uh, and having what's called a longer recovery model, of which Jenna's promise was listed as a stellar example. Um, I just want you to know these are all real, and we are facing them now. We are actually actively working on proposals. Um, but I want you to temper your enthusiasm a little. I think there's a little bit of thinking, I won't call it um, incorrect thinking, it's very hopeful thinking, that, oh, if we only increased the duration of residential treatment, everything would be fine. People would start off in a very positive place, and they'd be like Brad. How many years later? 20. 20 years later. Well, you know, let's talk about smoking cessation. The average time it takes a person to quit smoking is six to seven tries, which goes over not just days, but weeks, months, years. Uh, so are we going to say one stay in a residential treatment setting that was longer than two weeks suddenly the rest of life is, you know, nirvana. Uh, it doesn't happen that way. Uh, so I want to temper that, but I also want to say we should have longer stays in residential settings, and we need a recovery system and a housing system in recovery that allows people to keep their feet on the ground and at a very fragile time in their existence when they have just begun treatment and are entering recovery, uh, try to pave the way for success. So indeed, programs that have longer stays, but not necessarily for that initial sort of detoxification and withdrawal management part of residential treatment, but for the ongoing group work and the ongoing personal exploration work that goes on, when you need to have a setting where you can be protected from settings you've been in that aren't so healthy for you, but also allow you to actually do the good work and be uh, protected in some sense. So if you have a relapse in that early time, there's a sort of safety net to catch you and allow you to maintain housing in a recovery setting, uh, re-enter treatment, try again, uh, because it's such a tumultuous time in an individual's life. So we're all for working on much better and robust systems. And We've already many times talked about Jenna's Promise and the promise of programs like Jenna's Promise. They need even more evaluation, uh, and they need to have more models to propose, because what we have in Vermont, there's not a lot of stuff around the country that looks like that. Um, so a, a, a community-based, uh, workforce development-based program that extends the amount of time people are actually actively involved in a recovery setting with the safety net around them, so to speak, is really a very positive way to approach uh, addiction, and we need to continue to focus on that. Another goal is humanizing addiction, um, which I'll take as reducing stigma to a great extent, um, because uh, we all know uh, the challenges that provides. And I think just knowing that every person has value, understanding what I've talked about many times, that substance use disorder is a chronic brain disease. It's not a moral failing. And with the proper support, it's a treatable condition. I think just understanding those things is key. I think our society is making progress in that. Obviously, we always have a long way to go. In public health, we talk about the fact that we are in a syndemic. I'll teach you a new word today. Syndemic means multiple epidemics coming together. So post-COVID, we have a crisis truly, as we see in the paper every day in Vermont, in homelessness, housing insecurity. 
We have the ongoing crisis in substance use and opioid debts. We, not to mention debts from other substances like cocaine and alcohol. We have a mental health crisis. We have what many perceive in society as a public safety crisis, which is why so much work of this administration now is going towards community violence prevention and the connections of that to perhaps drug dealing and other societal factors. All of these things are coming together, um, but I think the public is now much more uh, aware of them and perhaps more empathetic than they've been before, though the fight against stigma will continue and needs to go on. And then the last goal I wanted to mention uh, is political attention, which I just take to mean trying to develop good policies within a state that uh, allow us to do good work. And I'll pivot off of that to take one of Jeff's slides uh, showing you the opioid overdose data. Now, clearly there's a national trend. We have fit into that national trend. It is real, I firmly believe. We do not want to blow this out of proportion. 5% and 230 plus deaths is still a tragedy. But the fact that we're at least bending the curve and things are starting to go the right way I think is important. And when you think about policies, you should thank God every day you live in Vermont. There are states that have drug paraphernalia laws that don't allow you to use a fentanyl test strip that make it a challenge to get Narcan to the population. Problems we've kind of solved in Vermont. We're now starting to uh, ex explore and use drug checking machines at our syringe service programs. Grants have gone out. We have grants for Nar Narcan vending machines. <clears throat> Unfortunately, not enough communities actually expressed a great desire for them, but we will have more than we have now. And we have Narcan going out all over the place for free and even anonymously you can get through our website, free uh, Narcan mail to your house. You don't even have to show your face in any public setting. So we've really done a lot of work, I think, in that regard to make sure that um, we can try to flood the streets and keep overdose deaths down as much as possible. The um, other major thing that's happened policy-wise, of course, is an overdose prevention center pilot will be developing in Burlington. And that won't solve all of our problems in all of the state, but it is another piece of the puzzle and another collaborative aspect of how we should view harm reduction. Uh, because we're doing so much in harm reduction, there isn't that much more to do. And overdose prevention centers represent a new pathway. I will say that uh, the Department of Health is very intimately involved in that work because we have to come up by now, between now and September with so-called guidelines for such a facility, knowing there are almost no facilities to draw from. There's two in New York City that developed in a very different way. There's one pending in Rhode Island but hasn't yet opened its doors, but the guidelines have been written. And then there's international guidelines for places in Canada, Europe, et cetera. Uh, so, very challenging work, but we are on our timeline and uh, adhering to that. The other piece of data was the stimulant data and the number of deaths from cocaine. Mo keep in mind, that was on a slide where most of those deaths were people who had fentanyl mixed with the cocaine. Um, people do die from stimulants, period, but I think all too often, they died because they thought they were buying stimulants and found out that there was more fentanyl bang for their buck than they bargained for, and they did not have the tolerance to that drug because their primary use disorder was a stimulant drug use disorder. If you look at the map, most of the western states are where the overdose rates have not gone down. I think that illustrates where we are in substance use now. They talk about 1.0, 2.0, et cetera. There's really been four phases of the substance use epidemic, starting with prescription drugs, which we hardly see now, 
moving on to heroin, which you can't even find in any powder you would buy anywhere in the country, then to fentanyl, and now to stimulants, especially methamphetamine west of the Mississippi. Uh, we're seeing the escalation in not methamphetamine as much as cocaine uh, clearly here. And I bring that up because there's a powerful treatment that's very evidence-based and that we are on the threshold of exploding all over the state, and that's called contingency management, which is a uh, reinforcement incentive kind of treatment. With opioid settlement monies, we've already been able to train most of the treatment providers all across the state, and we will also have the money to provide the incentives which have been proven to be effective in treating that disorder. So I would anticipate and cross my fingers and hope that we will see even less deaths from that pathway because people will actually be able to resolve their stimulant use problem and not be susceptible to death with fentanyl. So I think that's really key. And then I'll sort of close with just a few other sort of um, positives, because we want to talk about wins and positives here today. Um, I think the commitment of everyone who works with me on the Opioid Settlement Committee and everyone in the legislature and government right now is clearly keeping people alive. But keeping people alive means trying to connect people to treatment who you may never see before they turn up as an overdose death. So they may be on the streets or in a hotel or in a shelter. We now have a whole program of outreach workers that are trying to actually connect with those individuals. They may be people who uh, die alone or at home in a setting where they don't have anybody there to rescue them should they uh, experience a significant overdose. Uh, so we are doing as much as we can to pave the way towards treatment for all of that population that we can, and as you heard in my earlier comments, to try to stabilize people who are in that very fragile period of, I'm entering treatment, I'm trying to get into recovery, but that's a really tough time, and we're trying to make sure nobody is feeling abandoned if they relapse uh, and don't have the supports that they thought they would have. So I think those are really key. The, um, Construction industry you heard about, which is another great effort. Um, cannabis lock bags, so people going to dispensaries now can actually have a lock bag provided, which they put out hundreds and hundreds already. That's to protect kids, because you look across the country, every state that legalizes cannabis, you look at their emergency department visits for pediatric kids, and it goes up. Um, God forbid that would happen here, so hopefully this will be a protective measure. A little bit about alcohol. The major issue there is rapid access to treatment. Just like if you were brought into an emergency room with an overdose of opioids, you can be treated just like that and get on buprenorphine, meet with a recovery coach or peer counselor. Um, the same thing is starting to happen with alcohol. There are also medications for alcohol use disorder that are effective, tolerated well, and underutilized, unfortunately. So a whole effort to try to increase that. And then I'll close with uh, VT Help Link, because uh, is, is there anybody in the room not familiar with VT Help Link? Well, then I don't have to say anything. Oh, there's a, there's, no, we got a couple. So VT Help Link is really uh, a resource. It's like calling 911 if you have an emergency. It's call calling 211 if you just got flooded and you want to report things and see what kind of resources are available. If you call VT Help Link or a loved one calls VT Help Link and says, I don't know what to do, um, there's actually individualized approach to managing whatever the problem is. If it's connecting to treatment, finding recovery services, um, any substance doesn't really matter what it is. Um, it's confidential. It's non-judgmental support, and uh, provides immediate referrals uh, if those are what are what is desired. And all you need to do is go on the web, VT Help Link, um, and connect. Uh, and you can do it by web. You can do it by telephone. It doesn't really matter. 
So thank you, Brad and Melinda, for allowing uh, the Department of Health to come uh, and visit with you. We have so much more to say, but we'll let you keep the program going. Thank you very much, Dr. Levine. That was great. Um, and we do appreciate what Dr. Levine said about, you know, sometimes it's not the first time or the second time or the third time or the 17th time, but maybe the 18th time. And when that happens, you know, it's all good. Um, my next um, guest and speaker uh, is a friend of ours, Heather Wenzel. Uh, she is the Vice President of Civita Health. Uh, and which is supporting outpatient addiction practices in the Northeast. Heather is focused on improving rural health outcomes and increasing access to behavioral health services. She's also a credentialed leadership coach. She's pursuing a degree, I guess, a higher degree at LSU with a focus on health communication and leadership. And for more than two decades, Heather has supported teams providing service to the most vulnerable in upstate New York in both nonprofit and government work. Um, and Savita Health is um, our platinum sponsor, and we are so grateful for that. And I want to welcome Heather up here. Good morning, and thank you for the opportunity to speak on behalf of Savita Health. And many thanks to Melinda and Brad, our esteemed organizers. I'm sure this is going to be another lovely event, uh, just like it has been in previous years. With nine locations in Vermont, close to 20 in the Northeast, and I think we're at 57 now in seven states, we at Savita passionately provide in-person outpatient medication-assisted recovery long-lasting injections, counseling and care management, harm reduction services, hepatitis C screening and treatment, phlebotomy, and most recently, a small menu of primary care options. Our approach to care focuses on in-person interactions, and we are proud to offer same and next day services, including walk-ins and evening hours in every location in Vermont. When I thought about what we should talk about today and reflected on the themes of this year's summit, I wanted to hear from a member of our team who has been doing this work for decades, serving the most vulnerable in a very rural area in Vermont, the Northeast Kingdom. And I wanted to impact, I wanted to highlight the incredible impact of the blueprint, which we are so fortunate to benefit from in Vermont and specifically at Civita. This whole person wraparound model of care saves lives. So I'd like to introduce a valued member of our Savita team, Marsha Stricker. Marsha has been with Savita for almost three years and has over 30 years experience overseeing programs serving those struggling with substance use and mental health challenges in the Northeast Kingdom. She holds a master's prepared in mental health and is licensed in addiction treatment. She is a strong proponent of person-centered care and the blueprint hub and spoke model, which provides funding to Savita and helps us to pay for our care managers and also our licensed counselors. Marsha is going to highlight a key relationship between working fields and Savita. This is what blueprint funding brings to life, partnerships that allow our patients to regain purposeful lives. Marsha, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Heather. Wow, I'm short compared to everybody else. <laughs> um, good morning, recovery community. I'm going to step aside. Savita Health appreciates. Thank you. Savita Health appreciates your partnership because I can't, but I know together we can. Not really. Can you hear me? <laughs> Thank you. Is that better? Yeah. Thanks. Savita Health teams across uh, teams with every reco recovery center in Vermont across all nine of our sites. We value and see the effectiveness of recovery coaching 
and it's important to us to strive for a strong relationship with our recovery centers as we help people enhance their recovery journeys. As a Blueprint Spoke clinician, our community health team and our community partners are key to making those connections for those we work with. And like Heather said, Working Fields is one of those partnerships. One of our referrals uh, to Working Fields gave us a testimonial, a bit of a testimonial about his experience. And he reflects on this partnership with them as more than just finding a job. This individual states he feels seen and heard as a human being, and not just a culmination of the struggles that have presented in his life. Working Fields has always been in the, his corner to support and encourage him to keep pushing forward to achieve the goals that he set for himself. When he's feeling overwhelmed and discouraged, he knows he has a team there to provide the extra support for him to continue to move forward. In addition to helping this individual find meaningful employment, the Working Fields team has been there to assist with learning and understanding the newest technologies that have developed over the recent years that he didn't really know how to navigate, like most of us my age. And some of the members of the Working Fields team have shared their experiences that are similar, if not the same, which has increased his ability to trust others while navigating his own personal struggles that he's working hard to manage. Through working with the team at Working Fields, he started to reestablish trust in others. He states that he does not know where he would be in his life at this moment if he'd not been provided with the resource of working fields, but he's certain that it would not be anywhere as good as it is today. Carol Ricciuti is a partner to us in the Franklin, Chittenden, and Central Vermont communities, and I'd like to have Carol come up as well. Thank you, Marcia. And thank you to Savita for allowing us to have this time with you today. Thank you, Melinda and, and Brad, for putting together this summit. It grows every year. I am so grateful to be here today with all of you and talk about Working Fields. Working Fields is a staffing agency with a unique support model born from our founding father's experience in recovery and incarceration. Our mission-driven, person-centered approach promotes equitable hiring practices. Together with our partners, like Savita, we can provide everyone with employment opportunities. One example of our partnership with Savita is a job fair we held last fall at King Street Laundry. Participants had the opportunity to paint pumpkins and learn about our services. We have another joint job fair scheduled on August 6th at King Street Laundry. Working Fields has an incredible team, account managers and peer coaches surround our associates with support. We call our employees associates. Our associates work with a dedicated account manager and a peer coach. Account managers build relationships with job seekers and place them in roles that are a good fit for their career goals. Our peer coaches use the same model as recovery coaches. Through motivational interviewing and resource allocation, they support life's challenges. Since 2017, Working Fields has helped over 3,000 individuals build successful careers. Thank you for your time and, your for, and for your commitment to support our community by working together. Thank you very much, and thank you again to Savita for uh, making much of this possible. I um, want to mention um, just to briefly more goals of the summit. Um, we really support um, 
law enforcement with recovery and mental health workers uh, working together. It's getting better and it's a great model and I um, think that communities that are embracing that are finding success. Um, and we also advocate for um, more recovery in our prison systems and that is happening more now. Uh, if we give corrections residents help on the inside, they will have a much greater chance of success on the outside. And we believe that recovery help in prisons is imperative in conducting and should be conducted on a daily basis. And uh, we, I want to mention Tracy Hawk, who is down in Rutland, who's been a champion of that program and uh, just great work. So thank you, Tracy. So our next speakers and guests are um, uh, dear to our hearts. Um, Melinda White is um, going to be talking. Melinda is with the Turning Point of Franklin County and with Northwestern Medical Center. She's a woman in long-term recovery. She's known for hosting and producing a recovery rock star, a TV show aired through Northwest Access TV. She is Turning Point Recovery Coach Supervisor in the Emergency Department and Vermont Blueprint Matt Lead. She also serves on the Board of Directors for Vermont Alliance for Recovery Residents, VTAR. You heard from them last year with Jeff Morrow. Uh, and the St. Albans uh, Police Advisory Board as Vice Chair. Her passion for helping the community's most vulnerable people is what keeps her committed to volunteer and service work, as well as strengthening her personal recovery. With a heart for people and family struggles with addiction, Melinda's goal in life is to be of maximum service to God and her fellows. She is joined uh, by Peter Wright. He is the Chief Executive Officer of Northwest Medical Center in uh, St. Albans. Uh, prior to joining M NMC, Peter serves as the President of Bridgeton and Rumford Hospitals and Senior Vice President of Central Maine Healthcare. Peter has more than two decades of experience in hospital administration. He has served as President and CEO, CEO of Valley Regional Healthcare in New Hampshire. Chief Operating Officer of Littleton Regional Hospital in New Hampshire and Senior Director of Planning, Development, and Medical Group Operation of Copley Hospital in Vermont. Uh, so I want to welcome both Melinda and Peter to the podium. Thank you. Can you see me okay? <laughs> Been struggling with this height issue since I was 13. I, I, I always believe in the power of a smile, and so I'm, I'm a little off with Dr. Levine stealing uh, my Microsoft opening, my, my 45 uh, PowerPoint slide deck that's stuck in the cloud. <laughs> so I'll simply say, can you raise your hand if you're super psyched about your Apple stock this morning? <laughs> I, I, wanna, I wanna talk about a message about the power of one and the power of small. I want to talk about um, progress and hope. Uh, and, and then Melinda will talk about partnerships. I've had the great privilege to work with healthcare executives across the country through the American Hospital Association and see um, how other states and other communities are attacking this chronic illness. And I'm, I'm proud and happy to say that how we tackle it in northern New England, in Vermont, in New Hampshire, and Maine, and certainly familiar with Savita and their work, is perhaps the leading way across the country. That doesn't mean we should be comfortable. That doesn't mean we're there. But when I think about where we were 20 years ago, we were struggling to acknowledge that substance abuse was an issue. Where we were 10 years ago was thinking it was about choice and not a chronic illness in the same way that cancer, heart disease, and stroke. And where we are today is a unified community, the state of Vermont, our community partners, healthcare providers, and, and individuals within our community coming together and bonding together 
to support each other. We have a, an expression at NMC that we do not take care of patients. We take care of our friends, our family, and our community because we see them at Hannaford, on the soccer field, in the restaurants. And that's the power of small. The other message I want to tell you is the power of one. Sometimes we think this is a big systems issue, that the government needs to do something, that healthcare providers need to do something. And I'm here to tell you that this woman off to my left is the strongest proof, perhaps in the entire state of Vermont, that one person can make a difference. Yeah. I gotta let my heart rate come down a little bit. I nearly jumped out of my shoes. Oh, I believe it. When I came to NMC 18 months ago, Usually you do a, an internal assessment of your team and you find your, your strong players and, and your team members. And what struck me was this one person who was, is and always will be a member of the NMC team. But the logo on her paycheck is not Northwestern Medical Center. She moves seamlessly throughout our organization. She proves that the most effective power you have is the power of relationships. And the biggest thing you can give is the power within your heart. So when we talk about why some of those statistics that you saw earlier, what these Northwestern Medical Center seem to be, a, or Franklin County seem to be a different color. Why, why were they doing just a little bit better? There's no doubt in my mind that the very heart of that has to do with our partnership, our advocacy, and our rock star player on our team, and that's Melinda White. Thank you, Peter. That was not in the script. <laughs> uh, thank you, everyone, for coming. My name is Melinda White. First and foremost, I'm a person in long-term recovery, which means I haven't had to actively be in addiction since December 28, 2011. And there's so many... Thank you. You know, there's so many reasons the why behind it. Why am I able to live in a lifestyle of love instead of addiction? And so many of them are in this room. My mom's in this room, my sponsor's in this room, my husband's in this room. There's so many family members in this room, um, even if we don't have blood family. That's, in my opinion, how people recover is they get love. And it's not a fleeting moment of an emotion and a warm fuzzy. It's a decision that follows up with action. And that action is to show respect, equality, compassion, empathy. And I was not hatched with all of that. Maybe some of them, but not all of that. It's something that is intentional in every single day. And that's what I know me as a person in recovery, I need to commit to that every single day. To start my day waking up to say thank you, waking up to be grateful. People who do certain programs often hear, a grateful heart will never drink, a grateful heart will never use drugs. And that is so true. And sometimes it doesn't always align in the moment. There's times when I will say, thank you for this beautiful day. And I don't feel thank you for the day. I feel I want to go back to bed. I want to keep my fuzzy PJs. I don't want to do the day. But I say thank you for this day and I start moving because the feelings follow with once the actions are done. So the, I do the smart feet. People in recovery have smart feet, and those feelings do follow. And then we find that all of a sudden, not only are we grateful and it's aligning with that decision, but our cups are overflowing. I'm going to do my best. I'm really trying to dial back the emotion because there's so much emotion in this room. But if it comes out, it's gratitude. There is some sadness because first off, there's a memorial wall over there. And that's hard, right? It's hard to, to accept that. It's a hard part of this work. I'm going to talk about just a little bit the recovery coaching in the emergency department program that, that I'm part of. I'm going to just give three quick anecdotal stories. The first one is one of those sad tears the first one is a person who had a charge from age 17, but the conviction came at age 18. 
no further charges down the road, but we couldn't get that person into treatment. And it's not a lack of the current treatment places. It's a lack of overall, for those people that have certain convictions or sex crimes, where do they go? When they want to get healthy and stable and get off drugs and alcohol, where are they supposed to go? So that's a gap because I did some serious outreach for over a month trying to find a place for this person and I kept saying this person's not gonna make it, they're not gonna make it. And I had to write that person's name on the wall. You're gonna hear about a 50-50 raffle today. That's new, we're gonna start doing that every year. And the proceeds are gonna go to a family who's lost a loved one. And this year, the proceeds are going to that person and his family. So I try not to be a saleswoman, but I'm gonna say, please buy raffle tickets, $5 for one ticket, $20 for five tickets. They're available by a few people at the front and it's doing a good deed. We're gonna be calling the number at three o'clock. If you're not here and you didn't write your name and number on the back, we're gonna assume that you're donating your 50% to the family that lost their loved one. Next anecdotal story. Now here's some good ones. Oh, okay, keep going. Um, so the next anecdotal story, there's a person that it is a small world, right? We're talking about that. There's a person that their family had reached out to me and I connected with the family far before I connected with the individual. Finally, was able to connect with the individual and it took some time. That person tried treatment recovery, kind of didn't want to follow the recommendations, which is something we all do. I was guilty of that as well. And eventually, that person ended up at the emergency department and I was one of the people who was called and that person's family was there. The blessings of this is that the person got to a place of willingness and readiness and went and got treatment and went into a long-term recovery program called the Vermont Adult Teen Challenge. And that person is here today. Pete, can you please stand up? <laughs> Pete is a walking, talking miracle. Steve and Georgie, why don't you stand up, mom and dad? The power of praying parents is one of the strongest things in the world. <laughs> Pete will be in recovery breakout room number two, which is over here at two o'clock, two o'clock joined with other people, and I'm gonna have them stand shortly, but not yet, so don't be scared. I'm gonna give one more anecdotal story in the, re in the emergency department. So there's an individual who came on my radar, got into recovery, and then had a recurrence and struggled again. And when I saw this person the last time in the emergency department, he was broken. He showed me more willingness than I don't even know if I've ever seen somebody with so much willingness and desperation in that moment in the emergency department bed. And he was joined by his mom who was willing to do whatever it takes to help save her son's life. And that individual went on to go to treatment and then a long-term recovery residence. And after last year's summit, our rock star, Laura Allman with WCAX, WCAX reporter, Laura Allman, and I'm not done talking about her yet, she did a three-part addiction series in Vermont and she interviewed this person. Josh Lash, can you please stand up? <laughs> Josh almost lost his life. He almost lost some limbs but he was willing. And then again, what are one of the biggest ways a person recovers? The power of a praying mom. CJ, Celinda, please stand up. Love you. So Josh will be joined in recovery breakout room number two at two o'clock. And we've got a number of other panelists in that, breakout, that recovery breakout room. Panelists, please stand up. Ben, Randy, Katie, Mike, Josh. So if you guys wanna hear more of their stories at two o'clock, hop in the breakout room. If you wanna support the family that lost a loved one, please buy raffle tickets. And I'm gonna turn the floor back over to my friend, Peter. So I started talking about the power of one. I want a quick, quick message to the policymakers, the administrators, the media in the room. This is a chronic illness. We need to treat it that way. 
We need to stick with it. It is a, as you heard Melinda say earlier, a lifelong journey. It's no different than the other diseases that we work with. The power of one. Everybody in this room and everybody watching this later on has the power, has the ability to do something. Do not make the mistake of thinking whatever you are willing and able to do won't make a difference. It will. And we need to continue to stand up and to help each other. The power of small, the power in Vermont is we are all a community. We all make a difference. And we will be there every moment of every day that anybody needs help. Thank you very much. Don't forget that message. Thank you so much. Uh, I noticed um, we have more legislators may have come in. Uh, Senator Norris, uh, if you want to stand briefly, and uh, Representative Wood and Representative Taylor again. Uh, we very much appreciate you being here. And if there's any other legislators, um, please stand up too and um, and reach out. Oh. And thank you for being here. All right, so I mentioned a rock star. Brad and I absolutely love this person. She was introduced to us last year at this summit, and we've done a number of different projects with her because she has the heart and the passion for the work that all of you do and that we do. And we just want to give some recognition, and we do actually have a beautiful plaque that just happens to be at a different location, but we know that we're going to be seeing her after today. But more than anything, just to recognize a rock star, when we talk about destroying stigma, negative bias, and talking openly, this beautiful soul has done a number of stories to share about addiction recovery and treatment resources, gaps, solutions, in a strength-based way. So Laura Allman, just wave your hand, honey. Laura Allman, reporter with WCAX. We want to congratulate her, and she is getting the first Substance Use Addiction Summit Award beautiful plaque. Laura will catch up with you after so you get receipt of that plaque. And if I remember correctly, there's some kind of a surprise flash mob, something strange on the agenda. I wonder what that might be and if I wonder if anybody wants to come out from behind the curtain. Woo! We have a little surprise, a little treat, a little something different than just chatting at the mic.
one more hand for the Vermont Adult and Teen Challenge. Woo! And all of the rock stars in recovery that held up their sign. All right. Thank you. We love you guys. So the next person we have coming up to share about their organization is somebody who I consider a dear friend. Anthony, but I call him Tony Oshasny with Granite Recovery. Anthony Oshasny is a senior director of business development from Granite Recovery Centers in New Hampshire. Tony is a person in long-term recovery and began his journey in recovery in 2012. His outreach efforts have led to several outstanding relationships and friendships with community partners and providers throughout Vermont, most notably, and let me just pause here because I shortened his bio for this so you're not here for too long. The full bio is over there, and yes, I did hand select this part. 
His outreach efforts have led to several outstanding relationships and friendships with community partners and providers throughout Vermont, most notably with the organizers of this event. Brad and Melinda. <laughs> so Brad Ferlin and Melinda White. Uh, Don Teatro of Jenna's Promise. Lila Bennett from Journey to Recovery. I'm gonna ask you all to stand up. Lila, Don, Brad, like these are the most amazing partners in this state. Uh, <laughs> Rutland Regional Medical Center, Turning Point Center of Rutland and UVM Medical Center's addiction treatment programs. Tony joins, uh, joins us today to share about Granite Recovery Center's treatment model and to explain why outcomes have been so favorable for the many Vermonters who have led the opportunity to engage in treatment. Tony, come on up. <laughs> Hi, thank you. Tony O'Shaughnessy, good to be here. Um, thank you to Brad and Melinda. This uh, event really is second to none, a uh, grassroots campaign that I've uh, been working in the field for 10 years and haven't seen anything quite like this. So really, really impressive and the power of one, um, power of two here. But um, yeah, just really good to be here. I'll talk very briefly, explain the Granite Recovery Center's model. Uh, Granite Recovery Centers has roughly, or not roughly, excuse me, five locations uh, across New Hampshire, one in Portland, Maine and uh, roughly 400 beds, including about 70 detox beds. And I think what uh, differentiates Granite Recovery Centers and a lot of the treatment programs in New Hampshire from what um, you see here in Vermont is uh, the continuum of care. So that's kind of what I want to focus on, continuum of care and accessibility to treatment. So um, we've got detox roughly six or seven days. Uh, we have what a level of care, residential level of care, that's your traditional 28, 30 day treatment. Um, and after that, we have PHP, it stands for partial hospitalization, and IOP, intensive outpatient. Those last two levels of care, PHP and IOP, are traditionally delivered in an outpatient setting. So you go to detox and residential, you step down, go home, and you drive to PHP and IOP groups throughout the day. Um, of course, with a lot of folks who have substance use disorders, especially those who have New Hampshire Medicaid or uh, Vermont Medicaid, they don't have transportation and, and, and those sorts of things and easy access to outpatient treatment. So what we've done is provide those levels of care, PHP and IOP, um, but we provide the recovery housing. And so somebody with private insurance or New Hampshire Medicaid can come to treatment with us for up to 90 days and, and frequently longer. Um, detox, residential for 30 days, they can step down to PHP for an additional 30 days of treatment and then IOP for another 30 days. And we're billing the insurance company at that point and New Hampshire Medicaid a much lower reimbursement rate. So once you get down to PHP, I think it's like $190 per day. Uh, for New Hampshire Medicaid and then IOP is like $110 per day. The point is uh, we're providing longer durations in a controlled setting. We know there's lots of data showing that longer durations uh, produce better outcomes and so people are able to maintain abstinence for longer. Like Dr. Levine said, longer treatment durations don't necessarily mean you're going to stay sober forever that first time. but what we are seeing and what the insurance companies are seeing, which is why they continue to authorize longer stays, is that the recurrences are not as, so we still see people utilizing treatment um, multiple times, but they're getting nine months or a year before admitting to a detox level of care. So I don't know if that makes sense, but, but essentially, uh, they're able to maintain abstinence for longer periods of time before they re-engage. And in a lot of cases, um, they're not ever having to come back to treatment. Another thing that uh, New Hampshire has done exceptionally well is provide a lot of infrastructure to support people after they've completed their residential treatment. So we've got a lot of sober living. Uh, we call it sober living in New Hampshire. and. Um, it's primarily entrepreneurs who are in 
recovery themselves. They've been sober for five years, uh, they buy a multifamily home, and then are charging people a very affordable rate, $150, $175, $225 dollars a week, let's say. Um, and frequently that first month is paid for by our doorway program. The state has grant funding available. So people can go to treatment regardless of your health insurance for 90 days and then be able to stay in a sober living environment uh, at no cost for one month. And then from, from that point, we've partnered with organizations like Working Fields and others in New Hampshire. People are able to get employed and then afford $175 to $200 a week and really give themselves a shot at at sustaining long-term recovery. Um, so the continuum of care has been effective, especially for some of those Vermonters who've come over to New Hampshire. Additionally, uh, accessibility is really important. So at Granite, we've come in network with essentially every major insurance carrier in New England, Anthem, um, Optum, MVP, um, a list is about 40 40 insurance companies long, as well as all three Medicaid MCOs. So in New Hampshire, we have New Hampshire Healthy Families, WellSense, and AmeriHealth. Um, so regardless of your insurance, you have access to treatment. Our admissions office is open from 7 a.m. to 11 p.m., 365 days a year. So there's, there's somebody always in the call center available to complete an intake and get people into treatment really rapidly. We provide transportation through either one of our support staff or we've partnered with a couple of transportation companies that will go pick up people. In uh, last case scenario, we'll utilize Uber, Uber Health. So um, accessibility to treatment is not unique to Granite Recovery Centers. In New Hampshire, um, people can get into treatment the same day. Uh, with almost without exception, unless there are real severe biomedical complications or somebody's extremely psychiatrically compromised. Uh, along those lines, we know that people with substance use disorders have um, mental health issues as well. And so we recently got licensed to operate one of New Hampshire's, well, the only residential mental health program in the state that's available to um, people of all, all genders. So we're treating everybody um, and we're in network with roughly 40 insurance companies. So more, more than ever, people with mental health issues are able to access treatment. Traditionally, you present to an ED, uh, an emergency department, you're able to stabilize, and then you only have access to outpatient treatment. Well, now you can come to our residential mental health program, New Freedom Academy Behavioral Health, and again, stay for up to 90 days because we have residential, PHP, and IOP levels of care. Um, so that's a, an extremely accessible mental health treatment option. Nine out of 10 of the clients there have either a secondary or ter tertiary substance use disorder, primarily alcohol and cannabis, although there are individuals with opiate use disorder um, and, and others. But I guess what we're seeing is that um, individuals with severe mental health issues are turning to substances to treat uh, their mental health issues. So um, in addition to operating the four primary SUD facilities, we're now operating a primary mental health program. I would also say we have a uh, veteran and first responder specific service line at our uh, primary flagship location. It's called Rally Point Recovery and we're in network with the VA, so the VA and veterans can elect to go outside of the VA to get treatment, although we do frequently get referrals from White River Junction VA, so we're able to help primarily veterans, although um, some first responders as well. So that's great news on our end. Again, all of these individuals, almost without exception, have a secondary or tertiary substance use disorder, so it's, it's prevalent everywhere. Um, I wanted to say, you know, I talked last year a little bit about making Granite Recovery Centers and other uh, treatment centers in New Hampshire available to Vermont residents. Currently Valley Vista, Sana, and Serenity are doing detox and residential treatment. Once in a great while, there's a Vermont resident who has a family member 
um, who might live in New Hampshire. So when they complete their residential program after that 30 days or in Vermont, I think it's 24 days or something like this, um, they can utilize, we do not recommend it, it's not something we're, we're marketing, but occasionally um, somebody will, once they complete their residential stay at a place like Valley Vista, they'll reach out to their aunt, use their aunt's address, transfer to New Hampshire Medicaid, and then they're able to go to treatment for an additional 60 days. This is not something we're encouraging necessarily, but I think in an ideal world, if, um, if the state would partner with us and other treatment providers in New Hampshire, Vermonters could go through their detox and residential program here in Vermont and then have the ability to step down to our PHP and IOP and get to stay in treatment for an additional 60 days. Um, so those are just some ideas and, and a little bit of, about what we do, trying to re remain really modest about uh, the program. And, and um, But if you have questions, we'll, I'll be over by the booth and, and available to talk to anybody. But thank you for allowing me to speak, and thanks for the event. Thank you, Tony. Appreciate you. The next person I'm going to call to the podium is somebody that I've known pretty much since I started working in the field, uh, Gary DeCarolis from Re Recovery Partners of Vermont. Gary DeCarolis has led the transformation of the Recovery Partners of Vermont from a solely funded by state government to a dynamic, multi-source funded umbrella organization supported by members, private foundations, and donors. He has spearheaded building the membership base from nine members to currently 15 members. He helped secure private funding to support the development of dental, eye, and health care insurance for member staff. Gary also owns a history tour business titled Burlington History Tours and has a monthly CCTV cable program titled Celebrate Life. He is married to Barbara Benton and has three amazing daughters. He also has a more detailed biography in the hallway. I encourage you to read it. And I also am just so grateful because Gary has been a champion in the world of recovery. So Gary, come on up. That was a rocking piece of music and celebration. Boy, hard to follow. So good morning, everyone. I have a little bit of vertigo, so if I'm not at my 100%, that's why. Um, I'm going to tell the story of Recovery Partners of Vermont. And uh, I think it's a story that, uh, well, it's, it's compelling. Let's put it that way. So three years ago, uh, Vermont Recovery Network, which is our legal name, lost its director right around this time of the year and almost simultaneously lost all of its state funding. And for anybody who runs a nonprofit, never have one funding source to run your organization. If there's a lesson to be learned there, that's for sure. So I got a call from the board chair and said, Gary, can you help us out? Can you either help us shut this organization down, or if you've got some brilliant idea, we're all ears. So I said, well, let me talk to the directors first and see what they want. Do they even want an, organ an umbrella organization like this? Called them all up, listened to them, and they said, absolutely, we need an umbrella organization. Um, and I said, okay, I'll help you out best I can. So here's the deal. Um, we don't have state funding anymore. So if you pay half of our operating costs, I'll raise the other half, and we'll make a go of it. And they said, deal. So off we were to the races. First thing we did was change the mission of the organization. And basically, the mission is to help our members be the world-class organizations that they are. And our job was to make sure that happened. Secondly, we changed the name. We're Recovery Partners of Vermont now because we're all about partnership within the organization and with our brothers and sisters in the recovery field around the state. Then the first thing we did, which had never been done before, we brought together all the staffs of the recovery centers, recovery residences, the um, staff, board members, community partners, to a conference in um, mid-October. In fact, this year, it's October 22nd and 23rd. 
And what I knew from being an executive director of a recovery center myself for nine years is that there's amazing work that's being done in those centers every day of the year. There's a lot of wisdom, there's a lot of expertise, and they needed a forum to share that with each other because up until that point, all the recovery centers were just disparate organizations around the state. So we brought everyone together three years ago, and, they, with, and each of them offered a workshop. And all I said was, whatever you do the best, share that with others so they can learn. So they all came, they all provided a workshop, and they all started to learn from each other. It was a magical couple days together. Plus fellowship, um, and we added an evening event called the Recovery Stars Benefit Dinner where we recognize a few people for the great work they're doing in the recovery work field. This year, by the way, um, we're going to recognize the Tatro family for their amazing work at Jenna's Promise, turning a tragedy into something that saved hundreds of lives. And we're also honoring Lila Bennett, the executive director up at Journey to Recovery, for starting a social detox bed there which was the first of its kind in Vermont, and others are copying that as we go forward. After that conference, um, we needed to do a needs assessment. Where were these organizations at? What was going on for them? What do they need to become world-class organizations? And what we found quickly was this amazing group of people who are staff, all in recovery themselves, literally had no benefits and low wages. And we were basically taking advantage of people's passion for the work without giving them a decent wage and benefits to live with. So once we got that information, we went to the legislature and started a process of educating the legislature of what's going on around the state with some of the boots on the ground people who are doing this work every day to save lives and help rebuild lives. Well, the Vermont legislature is an amazing group of people. They were like dry sponges waiting to hear all this information. And uh, two years later now, I can tell you that they've pumped in over $4 million into our recovery system. Benefits today that were only dreams in the past, competitive wages that were only hopes in the past. We still have a ways to go, but they have made huge inroads into making the work that we do in our recovery centers a professional piece of work with decent wages and benefits. So today, three years later, we, I can say we have HR support for all our executive directors as they do their work. We have an EAP counselor for any staff member from around the state who needs a little counseling given um, the work that they do and Sometimes we have good days and sometimes we have bad days. We have a data consultant to help with all the data that needs to be collected around the state to satisfy state contracts and grants. We have multi-funding streams so that we're not relying on any one funding stream again. Um, and we have 14 members and we had nine three years ago. So we're doing some great work. And I, I just have to salute all of you that spend your days working within our recovery system. It is amazing work, and it does save lives and helps rebuild many more. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gary. Um, so we have three more presenters, and I just want to make a note that anybody who is hosting a booth, do not feel like you have to rush out, because we can pause the opening of the booth room until this is o over. And we do have staff that will encourage public to come in here if they're showing up. So um, our next presenter is somebody that I love dearly. I don't even want to look at her, because my makeup's already a mess. Uh, so <laughs> Greg and Don Tatro began Jenna's Promise in 2019 after the tragic loss of their daughter to substance use disorder. Jenna, her parents and brother experienced firsthand the emotions, 
trauma, sorrow, and emptiness that so often occurs at every level of the ongoing struggle against the opioid crisis. So instead of succumbing to hopelessness and despair, Greg and Don decided to turn to hope. Over the last three years, they've created, actually four years now, created a community of sober housing and treatment, workforce development, creating a program that should produce revenue to help support itself. Dawn has been one of our biggest rock stars. We absolutely love her dearly, and quite frankly, we would not be able to do this event without the support of Greg and Don Tatro. Don, come on up. My husband was supposed to come with me. He's yeah. standing there. there he Thanks. Um, <laughs> I want to thank Melinda and Brad. This event has grown so much, and it's just really overwhelming to see it. Um, Greg and I lost our daughter five years ago, which doesn't even seem possible. Um, I remember that day, and uh, I remember giving her CPR for 20 minutes, the two of us, and waiting for that ambulance that seemed like days. Um, I remember being on my hands and knees and begging God to save her. I remember the sheriff saying, we're gonna wrap her in a blanket and keep her safe. That day changed us forever. And um, I could have laid down and died. That's what I felt like doing or could stand up and help make change happen. And one of the things Jenna always wanted to do was help people, and she helped a lot of people, even though she was in the addiction herself. It was hours before she was supposed to go to Granite, and um, she had been to every um, Rehab, I think, from here, from New Hampshire to California, and a few twice. Um, but we decided to model it off granite, uh, very similar, having the um, the detox and the um, the rehab, and then we added the workforce and the housing. Um, and because uh, we had lived through this. We knew every time she turned around and failed, there was a gap. And uh, so we started Jenna's Promise. And uh, actually, Jenna's house is Jenna's house because she bought it with her life insurance, which was 235000 exactly. Can't make that up. Um, anyways, but our program has grown, and we've had 65 at least percent success rate. Um, and it's bringing people in. <laughs> and it's bringing people in from wherever they are. Um, we take 60, probably 60% right now from corrections and 40 from, um, you know, the state of Vermont. Um, but we give them trauma treatment. And we figured if we could, mental health is such a big part of this. If we could treat the mental health component, then we'd have something for tools when they decided, um, when they went out uh, back into the world. And then the housing. And then we also had a clinic to help deal with all the health care that goes with it and Matt. Um, and then workforce. And to see the people graduate now, 
Um, I see a couple of them back there. But um, they are, um, they have their lives back. They have a house. They leave with a house, a, you know, a place to go, a job, um, and the support always. So um, thank you, and thank you for all your support. And we can't, this, it's changed so much in five years, and uh, all of us working together is what makes a difference. And uh, we can't be in silos. We have to work together. And whether I have to call Tracy for something or Lila or Tony or Kevin, it's like we do this together. And of course, Danielle. <laughs> um, so I thank you so much for all your support. And uh, we are changing. Things are changing. I feel it. And um, so and it's a lot to do with you guys. Well, you can see I listen to my wife once in a while. <laughs> or I probably wouldn't be up here. But uh, I want to shout out to all the recovery centers and uh, the turning points and all the work that you guys do every single day with your heart exposed. Uh, I'd like any of the executive directors to stand up for a second from any, yeah. any of that. They do great work and they're saving a ton of lives. I want to talk a little bit about our involvement with AGC, it's Associated General Contractors. And Dick Wabi is the executive director, and his son, um, Reed Wabi, is, uh, went to Dick one day and said, you know, I want to, I want to uh, distribute Narcan to every contractor that's involved with the AGC. And Dick said no. And then, of course, Dick's a good friend of mine, and he cries when we talk about Jenna's promise most of the time. And he's a little rough around the edges, but a heck of a nice dude. <laughs> so, yeah, a little bit. So Reed says, well, would you do it if it was Jenna's promise? And he said, yes. And he said, that's all I need to hear. So here we go. And I'm going to, I've been texting Reed a little bit this morning. So far, in the last year or so, they've given out 18,000 doses of Narcan, last count in June. Five, <laughs> 5,000 harm reduction packs. And we are pretty sure we've saved at least five lives on a construction site. I've got a, I just got an email from Dick. We've got some, uh, some damn award here. Let's see. <laughs> it's an ASE uh, Power of Association Awards. It'll be given out in Washington, D.C. And it's for AGC and Jenna's Promise. Um, I don't know much more than that about it. But I, what I want to say is each and every one of us here we have to reach out in any direction that we can. One, one way, one direction, one, one way we do things is not how we're going to solve this problem. So we have to respect everyone in this room that maybe does things a little different. I look at Teen Challenge, you know, they're religious based in Vermont, the most atheist state in the nation, right? So, you know, we need to support those folks. We need to work with all our recovery centers, all our turning points. Brad and Melinda, I mean, they put their heart and soul into this thing, and they're doing it for one reason. It's the same reason each and every one of us is here, to save one life. And if we can do that, we're going to get it, save another life, and we're going to keep going. But we have to all work together. So I want to thank you folks. And uh, Don, thanks for allowing me to come up here, telling me to come up here. <laughs> Power duo, I love you guys. 
Our next speaker is somebody that I had heard about, and then I was at a, an award ceremony earlier this year, and she was the keynote speaker. And my heart hasn't been the same since. In a short time, she dug right in it. And while I already had such a love for what she's done in her life, to hear her firsthand has been something I have not been able to forget. So I asked Valerie Pallotta this year to, to come to the podium and share about Josh's house and the Josh Pallotta Fund. Valerie Pallotta is the president of the Josh Pallotta Fund. She is an advocate and strong voice in the community for veterans. Her involvement in veteran service organizations is extensive and began in 2009 when her son Joshua joined the Vermont National Guard to support Operation Enduring Freedom in Afghanistan. After Valerie's son returned from deployment in late 2010, he slowly succumbed to the effects of post-traumatic stress, traumatic brain injuries, and physical injuries, and ultimately ended his life in 2014 at the age of 25. In 2016, she and her husband established the Josh Pallotta Fund, Incorporated, a 501c3 nonprofit organization whose mission is to support veterans struggling with PTS and one day end veteran suicide. In 2021, Val, her husband Greg, and the Josh Pallotta Fund established Josh's House, Vermont, a wellness recreation center located on Hedgeman Avenue at Fort Ethan Allen. Josh's House is a respite retreat space for veterans and active duty service members where they can gain resiliency tools, receive massages, grab a meal, take part in healing, waters, fly, tying, use the 1,000 square foot gym, or share conversation over a cup of coffee, all free of charge to the veteran or active duty service member. Since opening the doors to Josh's house, they have welcomed over 20,000 visitors. Of those 20,000 visitors, there have been zero suicides. Valerie, come on. Oh boy. So, you know, you end up writing a speech and then you can't print it because you're out of ink. And then you bring your laptop and then you're like, no, I think I'll use my phone. And then you forget the wrong glass, the right glasses. And then <laughs> you, <laughs> you listen to all these stories and you totally forget who you are and what you do. <laughs> um, this, so as Melinda said, this is, um, this is our first year, my first year here. Um, before I go into what I want to talk about, I would like to acknowledge our team. Um, Josh's house would not be what it is today without our executive director, Andrea Gagne Murphy. Woo! And Courtney Blaney. Um, so forgive me if I if I um, have to read a few things. Um, I can't tell you how many times I've spoken about this, and ooh, they are the right glasses. Um, and I still uh, struggle um, with wanting to say the right things and sadly being the next to the last speaker, you probably are all really hungry and <laughs> um, I just want to make sure that the message gets out to all of you how I want to share it. Um, I feel kind of like an imposter among you all. Um, I'm just a mom who um, was in bed um, and heard a knock at the door because our doorbell wasn't working um, on the early morning hours of September 23rd, 2014. And I remember um, looking out the window because I couldn't figure out who was going to be knocking at the door and I actually thought it was Josh. 
And then as the people who came to the house were trying to find somebody home, they walked around towards the back of the house and I saw the police vest on the, that they were wearing. And um, immediately I thought that Josh had been arrested. Um, he came back from Afghanistan and was doing pretty well. Um, and then as Melinda said in my bio, he started to slowly struggle. Um, Part of that struggle was um, fighting with his mom. Um, and in return, a mom who was trying to give him tough love. Um, he wasn't working. He was, you know, didn't have any money. Um, ultimately, that argument led to nine months of us not talking. And ultimately, um, not speaking to him before he ended his life. So the number one thing that I um, want to say is if I could do things over and make different decisions, I probably would do that. It probably wouldn't make a difference um, as loved ones and caregivers here know um, when you're living with and love somebody who is struggling, um, it's not really about us. And it's taken me a long time to um, convince myself, I guess. Because um, you know, as a mom, you're supposed to save your kid, right? Um, so to the parents here um, who have survivors and who've lost their child, my heart just goes out to you. There is nothing worse ever than um, losing your child. So among us um, here, oh, stepping back a little bit, sorry. Um, I was involved with Blue Star Mothers um, before Josh. We, we charted the first Vermont chapter of Blue Star Mothers in um, 2011 um, when, when a bunch of mom gets to, a bunch of moms get together, they wanna, you know, protect their kids and fix things. And so we did a lot of research and found that um, Blue Star Mothers of America was a great resource or organization to, um, to start. And we did a lot of work with Blue Star Mothers of Vermont. We supported so many um, service members and veterans financially um, with emergency funds and things like that. Um, through that, role, I met a lot of people and was out in the community quite a bit. And um, the morning that Josh died, um, he, the morning he died, he was online with one of his buddies um, who had been deployed with him. And Josh was talking to him and said, you know, I, I don't know what to do. I want to give up. Um, and his friend said, hold on, I just need to go take a piss. Um, sorry for the, <laughs> the direct terms there. But, um, and when he came back, Josh was gone. And that person has struggled and felt guilty probably worse than I have. So another thing I want to say to you is that it is not our fault. Not our fault. So people with my, with my relationship in the community, people started just sending money in honor of Josh. Um, we had the funeral and um, talking about um, be the one and you know, um, what, what's the what's the term that you guys use? Because I'm just confusing it with the other. Is it be the one or uh, the? It takes one. I, it takes one. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you. The the I've been hearing it all morning and I can't think of it. So it takes one, and then the um, American Legion has be the one. So there's this message here that one person can make a difference. Um, and we've seen that multiple times this morning. There were over 900 people 
at my son's funeral. Those were people who might not have even met Josh, but when you talk about that ripple effect, one suicide spread out and it was just over 900 people and then expanded even more. So we came together, we created the fund, we asked some of the guys that Josh was with, what do you think would have helped Josh? What do you need? And they all said, we just really want a place to be together and hang out and play video games and you know share a meal. And so the idea of Josh's house was born. So I was working full time and met with um, Stephanie Miller Taylor, who is um, part of the Miller family, um, who have donated tons of money. And Stephanie sat my husband and I down and said, you really need to hire somebody or this is not going to work. So we did, and that was Andrea, and it worked. <laughs> So anyway, um, Melinda shared the statistics, so I won't go into that again. Um, there is somebody in this room who was deployed with Josh, and I am just so proud of you and everything you've done and how far you've come. And I just want to acknowledge that publicly, and I hope it's okay. <laughs> um, so there are people in this room, as you know, who do amazing things. We're EMTs, first responders, mental health care professionals. Most importantly, we are survivors. Um, some of our desire or call to serve is driven by illness or loss. Some is a spur of the moment decision to save a life. We felt called and we did it. Sometimes I feel like my motivation was based on guilt. If I push myself to the limits, maybe I won't feel like such a failure as a parent. I'm still working on that. Sometimes it's motivation to distract you from the grief and loss. It's from not picking up that drink or not taking that drug. Um, I am not um, an addict. I could have been, though. And the thing that saved me was being pregnant, getting pregnant. So my son has saved my life. And as I get along in years, <laughs> I'll be 58 next Saturday. Um, <laughs> yay for you, Melinda. <laughs> oh, um, I'm, I'm experiencing a lot of health issues. Um, and I've heard that some of these health issues are triggered by trauma. And a lot of these health issues I didn't have before this trauma. Um, I have a dear friend who died on Wednesday at the age of 49. Her um, son was 14 when he ended his life. Um, and her health issues started pretty much right after that loss. But so many things like fibromyalgia, chronic pain, sleep disturbances, um, overweight, and um, a new diagnosis for me of ADHD. Go figure. <laughs> um, and I say these things because I'm pretty sure that there are people out there who are experiencing some of the same things. There seems to be a huge correlation between grief, loss, stress, and health altogether. And I don't think I need to tell of you because you all probably know that already. But why do I mention this? It, I didn't know a lot of things until Josh died. I have not wanted to be here myself since then. He's my only child. I, have no intentions on ending my life, but I really wouldn't be too broken up if I just happened to leave the surf. But that's changed slightly because I know I have work to do. And I know there are people who would be really pissed at me. So. Mm -hmm. 
I had to put myself on the back burner. And this is part of why Melinda wanted me to speak, because speak on this topic. All of you here are caregivers, and um, one of the things I want to know is how many of you, you can raise your hand or not, how many of you put yourself on the back burner? <laughs> how many of you used to put yourself on the back burner and are doing more self-care now? Oh, awesome, awesome. So I say that because I've heard um, whole health be described as a uh, three-legged stool. You know, you have the seat, which is you, and then you have one leg, three legs. And each leg represents a component of health. One is body, one is mind, one is spirit. There, there are many variations to this, um, but I'll use this one for this example. If one of these legs is broken or loose, the whole stool is off balance, right? It kind of wobbles a little bit. If two of them are kind of off balance, then the stool really is not functioning and supporting you. And then if all three are broken or damaged or not taken care of, then the stool falls. Um, I, I went through the University of Vermont's um, Integrative Health and Wellness Coaching Program and got my certification for um, national board certification. And I remember learning the wheel of health that is out now. And now there are nine tenants, not three. Are you kidding me? <laughs> I can barely keep up with the original three. So these are things like um, environment and my uh, work-life balance, things like that. But they make sense, don't they? Career, relationships, sleep. When you're experiencing trauma, loss, long work hours, sick children or parents, and you add that to an already wobbly or shaky stool, more health issues come up. And I often think of the things that I could have done back then to prevent these issues from happening, but I didn't know then what I know now. If I had only taken time to nourish my body, mind, and soul, um, these uncontrollable things in my life might be more manageable. And I can't go back, I can only go forward. So let's talk about the stool for a minute, and I'm gonna ask you a few questions. And you're gonna go, eh, why she's asking this stuff. <laughs> So you can either keep it to yourself, write it down, shout it out, whatever you want. What do you do to take care of your body? Do you exercise regularly? Do you eat a healthy diet? Do you get regular massages? Do you protect and nourish your skin? What do you do for your temple? If you're not doing anything, what do you think you will do? Make a plan because for those of you who are not my age, it, there's still so much time to change that and to make a plan. And even my age and for those of us older out here, you can still make a plan to change that health. Set that SMART goal. So let's move on to the second leg, the mind. What are you doing to expand and nourish your mind? The mind is one of those things, as we know, that if you don't use it, use it, it can start to slowly disintegrate. Do you challenge your mind? Do you do crossword puzzles? Do you read um, educational books? Do you challenge your mind to keep it active? Do you meditate? Do you read inspir inspirational writings or biographies? Do you journal? Take classes. You're never too old to take classes. <laughs> now let's talk about our soul, our spirit. This leg has been the most important piece of my grief journey. I felt so out of control in life and I ended up going to a funeral for a friend of my mom's and um, it was like, God hit me upside the head and said, okay, you need to come back. 
So I brought myself back to the Catholic Church and I finally feel at home and um, trying to do those things that are nourishing my spirit and my soul. Do you pray? Do you attend religious services? Do you sit in silence? Do you spend time walking in nature? There are a few things that I have found that kind of nurture my all three, the body, mind, and spirit. And one of them, I think, is walking in nature and um, just really being at peace without the music and just moving. I feel, I feel the best after doing that. Um, not so much now. We have a, a bear and some coyotes, so I kind of am <laughs> a little bit more fearful now when I go, but. So think about that when you're in your recovery and you're making your plan for the day, how can I fit in three things? Something for my body today, something for my mind, and something for my soul. Now, the last thing I wanna ask you, and probably the most important question, do you ask for help? Because if you don't ask for help, you will fail. Josh's house would not be where it is today without help. Jenna's promise is would not be here today, I'm sure. I'm speaking, you know, um, I'm assuming, but you can't do things on your own. I wasn't gonna fail. I could not fail my boy again. I just it could not happen because I've spent the last almost 10 years feeling like I failed my son. So we opened up Josh's house, 2021. What was happening in 2021? COVID. <laughs> but we did it, right, Andrea? We just, we did it and it worked and people came and people made meal, meals, excuse me. People got massages and we've expanded things to adding a women's only group, women veteran only group. Um, we have a thousand square foot gym. If you are a service member or a veteran, please come to Josh's house and use the gym. It's free. And if any of you know Andrea, you know that that is probably the state of the art gym, the, the, the highest state of the art gym that you could possibly have. And it doesn't get a lot of use. Um, but we did it and we opened it and they came. And it took a while for them to come, but they came, 20,000 of them. We get 100 new people a month, three new people a week, and that number fluctuates depending on the time of year. And what do they come mainly for? The meals, the coffee, just sharing a meal and a cup of coffee with somebody. That's self-care. These are some Vietnam veterans who had never been welcomed home. They came to Josh's house and there was a ceremony and they were welcomed home. And one of them who is a dear friend of mine is in his late 70s and he said, I have never been welcomed home before. And he's got tears in his eyes. That's when you know you are doing the right thing. Who's in your corner when you need to be lifted and supported? We always focus on those we're not reaching. And I'm so guilty of that. A suicide, I take that on me. Why didn't they come to Josh's house? What are we doing wrong that we're not reaching them? And I know that's BS because it's not my fault. It's nobody's fault that they're not coming. But the others are. The 20,000 that are still here are coming and are still here. And I have to focus on that. Do you ask for help? Because Lord knows it's really hard for us who are in this type of work to ask for help. 
I love asking for help now. <laughs> I'm doing it at work at my regular job and it is the best. <laughs> Why didn't I do that long ago? <laughs> Mother Teresa said, a life not lived for others is not a life. She believed that true fulfillment and purpose come from dedicating ourselves to serving others. By living for the well-being and happiness of those, whoops, shoot, just lost it, sorry. By living for the well-being and happiness of those around us, we find true meaning in our own lives. And that is so true. But please don't forget about yourself. Because as the overused but very relevant saying goes, you have to put that oxygen mask on yourself first or you, are no, or you are no good to others. So I challenge you, along with myself, what are the things that you can add to your life to support your three-legged stool? It takes an extremely selfless person to do so much for so many, to fight the demons within, to be sober for one more day, one more hour, one more minute. They say you go through things in life for a reason. I don't know what the reason is for losing Josh. I kind of like to think it's because we're saving lives. But I hurt every single day. And the grief and the pain eat away at you cell by cell. But having a community of support and people who are around you who want to help and want to do something, that makes all the difference. I am truly blessed. I never would have met the people I've met if it wasn't for losing my boy. And I'm grateful for you and I'm grateful for him and I'm grateful for everything that we do to support those who are struggling and those who are in pain. So thank you. And with the Vermont National Guard Family Programs Office since 2012, first as the Family Readiness and Program Manager, and then most recently promoted to Director on May 1, 2023. Previously, Ms. Boyle worked in the private sector financial and mortgage industries. Ms. Boyle has her Master of Science and Administration degree from St. Michael's College. Ms. Boyle currently serves on the Dragonheart Vermont Board of Directors, as well as the Champlain Housing Trust Loan Committee Board. Ms. Boyle is a past board member of the American Red Cross, and the Vermont National Guard Charitable Foundation. Ms. Boyle resides in Burlington with her orange tabby, Satchel, and has been a Formula One auto racing aficionado since the 1990s. Come up to the podium, my dear. <laughs> and a tabby. I know, right? Love it. Thank you so much. Thank you for inviting me to a powerful and life-affirming event. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. My name is Miriam Boyle. I am the Director of Family Programs with the Vermont National Guard. Family Programs assist Vermont's veterans, service members, and their families, from cadets to retirees and beyond. We assist all branches of service, which would be Army, Air Force, Marines, Navy, Coast Guard, and Space Force. <laughs> Just wanted to say that. We don't, have any, we don't have any clients yet, but I'm sure they'll come at some point. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Vermont has roughly 43,000 veterans enrolled in the VA at this time. We have the Vermont National Guard Army and Air. We also have two re uh, Army Reserve Centers. We have one Navy Operational Support Center, and we have a Coast Guard detachment down at the Burlington Waterfront. The papers are all out of order here. 
On any given day, we will be assisting veterans with their VA benefit issues. We might be helping service members find financial resources that they need, and we might be helping families find caregiver services. We also have Vermont Veterans Outreach and Military and Family Readiness Specialists that are located all throughout the, the state in our armories. We also have a 24-7 military and family support call center. And that number is 888-607-8800. And I'll repeat that again if anyone needs that, if we have any veterans in our audience or family members of veterans. The call center is manned 24-7, 365. We will not make you stay on hold and we will not make you listen to Kenny G music. <laughs> I, my apologies to any Kenny G fans. Again, that number is 888-607-8773. On this call center line, we might hear from veterans who are having issues with their health or with their VA benefits. We might hear from community partners, uh, social workers that are working with our clientele and they need assistance. We will hear from fa family members who are concerned about their, their veteran or service member. We even hear from neighbors that are concerned about the veteran that lives next door to them. And can you help us please, or help them? Please um, visit our, our booth um, that is, has two staff members and they can answer any questions you might have and we have resources on that table. There's a Japanese proverb that I find very profound. Fall seven times, stand up eight. Being in recovery is a process in which a person is overcoming an addiction or a health condition. It does not mean that you are cured. There is no such thing as that in addictions. But I also feel that recovery represents hope. If we falter or slide backwards, there is always hope that we can start again. It is never easy, but we don't lose, if we don't lose hope, we can recover with the help of others with others that are struggling, as we are, peer support programs, family, and friends. So if you fall seven times, stand up eight. On a personal note, I have an older brother who drank from the age of 11 until he was 30, and at which time he checked himself into Maple Leaf. Well, this is 1989, so Maple Leaf was a longer term treatment center in Underhill. And before he left, he was told that for his group, four out of the five of you will be back. Frankie is in recovery, has been in recovery for 35 years. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. We're, we're very proud of him. So thank you very much for having me here and um, hope everyone has a, a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much. Absolutely. <laughs> you are awesome. You're very welcome. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Yeah, you're welcome.
All right, so just a couple of quick housekeeping items and then I'll let Brad co close us out. So this afternoon we have three breakout rooms. At one o'clock we have Dr. Suzanne White. Anybody who's met her before knows that she will capture your attention and she's funny. Not only is she brilliant, but she's funny. So that's at one o'clock. Um, she's gonna be talking about substance use treatment and recovery. And at two o'clock is a recovery panel breakout room and I had the members stand up earlier so they're gonna be sharing their stories of recovery and then open, open it for Q&A. And then in breakout room three, we have Vermont Health Department's Dana Bourne, who's gonna be doing a contingency management workshop on tobacco cessation. So I love that that was brought up earlier in the summit. The booth rooms are gonna be open from noon to four. Also Blue Heron are gonna be playing outside. So Blue Heron are dear friend of ours, uh, Ethan and Marty. So Ethan Sawyer, Marty Frederick, guitar duo, tons of fun, love these guys, you're gonna be outside. There's also some rescue doggies outside and there's also a medical mobile unit outside. There's food for sale throughout the day. Please feel free to sign up on the memorial wall and also please feel free to buy as many of those raffle tickets as you can because they're gonna be benefiting the family of somebody who lost a loved one and we're gonna be calling off those numbers at three o'clock this afternoon. Thank you all for being here. I'm gonna turn it over to Brad, love you lots. And a huge thank you to Brad for having the brainchild of even doing this. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, thank you everyone. I want to thank again Savita Health, Champlain Valley Expo, and WCAX, our prime sponsors, and uh, uh, Vermont Health Department, Department for Substance Use. Sponsors are listed all around uh, the building. There is great food for sale just around the corner, and people might be starving now. Um, legislators, thank you for coming. Um, we really appreciate you being here. Spread the word to your colleagues. We, we need the help. And lastly, thank all of you. And we remember one thing. There is always, always hope, and you matter. So thank you.